So I'm not sure I have 18 minutes worth of discussion on maniacal focus, but um, so I'd like to definitely um, offer anyone to be able to raise hands and ask questions and that kind of stuff to make it um, interactive. But um, sort of my story, and, and I'm not sure I have any aha moments. I'm a, I'm a slow learner, so sometimes it's a lot of things I got to see in a row before something comes clear. Um, and so for me, there was, um, as, as we started Open Table, one of the, the things that, you know, sort of the initial idea, and this is, you know, four days into it sort of thing, was that it was going to be called Easy Eats, um, and then there was going to be Easy Putts, and then Easy Docs, and then Easy Cuts, and so it all these verticals around going after uh, different things, you know, outside of the restaurant space. Um, and probably on day five, we discovered that uh, people didn't want to associate food with haircuts and those types of things, and or doctor's appointments, and, and that the restaurant space was actually a fairly large um, industry. So it's, I don't know, 600 billion a year in revenue or something like that, and there's 900,000 food and beverage outlets across the, the country. Um, and a food and beverage outlet, you know, Six Flags has like 50 of them. So, a, you know, hot dog stand is also considered a food and beverage outlet, but big industry um, either way. And so, um, so thinking about, okay, focus on restaurants, uh, and, and that makes a lot of sense. But then, you know, there's a lot of different types of restaurants. There's the hot dog stand. There's the, you know, all the way up through the reservation. And sort of the idea came around uh, watching my wife try and make restaurant reservations one day, and it was a Saturday morning. Um, in the past, arguably not the best time to try and make restaurant reservations. A lot of restaurateurs weren't in, you know, they were still drunk from the night before or, uh, you know, just hadn't got there yet because there's no deliveries, so they tend to, you know, take their time a little bit in the, on Saturday mornings. And um, between City Search, um, which is still around, and Microsoft Sidewalk, if anyone remembers that, those are definitely old school uh, internet people or older school internet people. Um, and then Zagat, the maroon guide, was not online yet. So she spent about three hours, three and a half hours, trying to make plans for the next Friday, Saturday, Sunday night for her parents who were coming into town. Um, her father is one of the co-founders of Let Us Entertain You, so it's a lot of challenges to make sure you get some good restaurants out in, in, uh, in San Francisco where we lived. And so, um, uh, you know, I just said there's got to be a better way than this sort of thing. I had a friend who um, was starting a company called Evite, which is the online invitation system. Um, I had another friend who was starting a company called North Point Communications, which was one of the first DSL companies sort of post-deregulation. Um, I had another friend who was like employee number 12 at Yahoo and you know so there are all these really cool things happening um, around the, this thing called the internet uh, which was getting kind of popular out in the Bay Area that's where I was at at the time and so um, so you know we, we, we started uh, around the reservation piece and I thought I was just going to plug um, the internet into the back of all these terminals that were of course sitting at restaurants um, with reservation technology and whatnot and what we found is there were no um, this was about day seven uh, in the process. There were no um, rest there were no terminals. There was one person who had a piece of software uh, who had about fifty or sorry about seventy five restaurants across the nation. So um, we decided, well, there had to be this sort of single inventory system that um, you know if someone called or if someone booked online, the reservation would happen in in, uh, in you know take up the same inventory because it's because restaurant inventory is very complex relative to um, like a flight or a hotel. So flight takes off, it's got 115 seats or whatever. All 115 of those seats, you can't fit 116 people on a plane with 115 seats, so, um, but you can fit 30. But in a restaurant, um, you know, a two top, two tables that will seat two, you could put two of those together and that could seat four. Or maybe you have a four top that flips up and now seats six, and a two top will turn in about 75 minutes, a four top will turn in about 90 minutes and a six top or higher will turn in about two hours, so 120 minutes. And so if you put two twos together, now they both went from 75 minutes to 90 minutes as a, as a or you even put three, you know, so, so there's a lot of complexity in the, the restaurant reservation management space. So, um, so it was a very, uh, uh, you, you know, trying to, and so let me go back to, to maniacal focus, why I'm sort of here. Um, so there's a woman named Jalee Bisharat who worked um, directly with Jeff Bezos um, at, uh, at um, Amazon and was credited with sort of the one-click now or buy now, um, one-click um, purchasing at Amazon. And so we brought her in, um, fortunately, and had her as a, um, she just left Amazon and was uh, only wanted to work part-time. And we were like, great, we'll take any time, you know, we can get for you. 
And um, so she came in and sort of really helped us sort of think about this maniacal focus. And for us, it got to be, how do we get another one of our boxes, which is what we call the electronic reservation book, which is, sits at the restaurant. And if any of you have been to a restaurant, you'll see that terminal that sits at the host stand. That's generally our box. Um, just a PC, client server architecture. But that's the um, reservation management tool that helps them take a reservation over the phone into that. Or if one comes to the internet, it also goes directly into that. So, um, you know, while we were sort of growing the company, a lot of people were talking to us about things like, um, for some of our clients who had restaurants and in hotels, they were like, well, how do we do a room service application? Or how do we do a queue management application for something like a Cheesecake Factory who doesn't take reservations and, um, uh, but has this large queue problem that they need to work with, of, you know, managing the wait at the door and that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, we would, you know, sort of go in that direction a little bit. And, you know, and, and so Gillet kept correcting us back to this, you know, maniacal focus. And so it got to the point to where, as an organization, um, sort of if a restaurant could sign a contract, we would get the system in. And that was all that we were focused on is how do we get another box in a restaurant that took reservations. And so we went from this market that had, you know, 800,000 or 900,000 food and beverage outlets down to about 30,000. So we excluded a lot of people. And it took a lot of discipline within the organization to say no. So we, we got to a culture of no. Um, and I like how Seth Godin talks about it. So there's, you know, sort of saying no as your default answer can be good or bad, right? So if, you know, you can either be that supercharged person that says yes for everything um, and you know has no has no obstacles or no barriers or what we were is that disciplined company that if it wasn't a reservation centric restaurant and it wasn't in one of our core markets the answer was no and if they wanted a special feature or something um, you know that was very specific to their particular restaurant uh, the question the answer was not right now we'll put it in our queue and when we get to it and want enough people ask for it um, we will then uh, put it out, you know, make it make it available. And so, one of the things that has helped Open Table through time has been this: that forever, for a long time, up until recently, we had about seven or eight engineers who wrote both the product for the restaurant and for the website. And so, you know, and, and the reason we were able to do that is because of our maniacal focus of saying no, no, no. This is what we have, and. Um, you know, not every company is sort of has the, the discipline or the ability to, to do that. And this is one stat that I wish I would have brought for, um, for the, 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 uh, the, the discussion today. And that the, high, the restaurant industry is a high fixed cost. So they've got the seats, they've got the real estate, they've got the cooks, they've got the stoves, they've got all that kind of stuff, but a low variable cost business. So the price of food is only about 30% 30, 30 of the check. So if you buy a $10 steak, only three bucks of that went to paying for the food. So incremental diners are about a 70% margin for them. So if a restaurant did 400 covers one day, if they would have done 420, they might have doubled their profit over 400. So those incremental diners are a very big deal for um, restaurants. Just like, you know, plane taking off, if that seat's empty, that's lost revenue. If someone pays $300 to sit in that seat, probably 298 of its profit, right? There's a little bit more fuel or, you know, an extra little um, cupcake or something they give you or whatever, right? So, so the restaurant industry is a very similar um, uh, phenomenon, and so it was all about incremental diners. And as you look at the cost of the system that the restaurants pay, they, it takes them about, um, and this is a stat that's on the open table, open table site, which I really like, it takes about 12 incremental diners um, at, a rest, at one of our typical restaurants to pay for the system for the month. Um, so not terrible. And on average, and this is where I think it's kind of cool, is we bring a restaurant about 300 diners a month. Not all incremental, so we've done some research to try and figure out what that um, um, you know, what was incremental of that? And we figured out it was about 25%. So about 75 people takes 12 to pay for the system. So from our standpoint, we were bringing so much value to these restaurants that we could be in that disciplined position of that maniacal focus, no, um, uh, you know, mindset. So, um, I mean, that's, I've talked actually longer than I thought I would for that, but are there, are there any questions about um, sort of open table and things we've done. I can jump into some more um, stuff I'm working on now, but just want to kind of open it up to, to see. go ahead. How did you decide that, that was going to be your focus? The getting the ERB in the restaurant? Um, because there was, first of all, there was no one else doing it. 
And so the first, well, that was one of the reasons is there was no one else doing it at the time when we first initially launched. And um, I was able to talk uh, three different companies into writing. I'm not a programmer, I'm a, I'm a um, business person in quotes. Um, so we were able to put uh, three different um, people wrote us a piece of code that we kind of put installed in t into four restaurants, actually two here in Chicago and two in San Francisco. And it was a terrible piece of product, but they got the concept and they really enjoyed that and were struggling to um, do a lot of this stuff on, uh, you know, right now pencil and paper and, and you know, they'd put it up in, in their shelf after that book was full and they'd lose all this rich data on their customers. And so um, it just, in what it, and the other thing that it did is it worked really well for a business model. So um, the, and it's the thing that people hated now, which they love and the market um, is, is rewarding us for today. But um, so the um, uh, restaurants who are full don't need more customers. What they want to do is take better care of their current customers and know who their current customers are and who their VIPs are, who their big spenders are, those types of things. And what our system did is it allowed uh, restaurants to be able to track who those people were more easily. And so what we were able to do is target sort of the top tier of restaurants. The, you know, we, we used to use as a gap most popular um, uh, category. And we'd look at, so those are the top 20 or top 25 restaurants in a market we'd go after. And once we could get five or six or eight of them who weren't, didn't really care about internet reservations or more business, they now had this tool. Now the next 50 or so all aspired to be those top 20. So whatever the top 20 were starting to do, those next 50 would all sort of move in that direction. And now you start to get enough critical mass to where when a consumer comes to the internet or the, the, the site online, there's a high chance that there's, they're going to convert to a reservation. So now you're starting to bring in business to these restaurants. So the next 200, 300, 400 restaurants who need more business, now they're jumping on board. So it was this nice sort of cycle that actually worked for us. We could create a network effect, um, which was a big, you know, it's still big to talk about today, but certainly in the Valley with a lot of the venture investors out there, you know, and eBay was going nuts at the time and all this stuff like that. How do you get these sort of two-sided network effect business models? And that's, you know, sort of how we fell into it um, and, and why discipline, you know, and focus. I mean, if you look at the site today, there's still very little that can take you off that six screen um, reservation process that you'll go through because we wanted to make it a tool that got butts into seats and, and kept that box in restaurants. Any other questions? I, I've noticed recently uh, starting to see coupons come through open table. Is that something new or is I just not notice that? Uh, no, there's a spotlight. So we've knocked off Groupon in our own little thing. <laughs> Um, shamelessly. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's a tough situation because the restaurants are our customers. And so you cheapen the, uh, the um, experience by giving discounts. No, no high-end restaurant likes to give discounts. They'd rather give you an extra truffle or glass of champagne or something like that. So um, it's been a really fine line that we've had to walk. But yeah, that's a relatively new um, phenomenon that came out five week, or three months ago or something like that. So Okay, so I'll uh, go ahead. What is your exit strategy? At Open Table, IPO. Uh, it was from the get-go. So I, I was in Silicon Valley. I was taking venture capital. I raised 49 million bucks. Uh, there's not many other options besides an IPO. Um, so uh, an actually interesting piece about that is sort of our maniacal focus um, helped us in that, um, and so did the downturn of the first dot-com implosion. Because we raised 36, first of all, we raised 10 million in um, January of 2000. So in March 27th or whatever of 2000 is when the, the implosion started to happen or, or around, around that time. And so we had this 10 million bucks that was sort of carrying us through the rest of the year. And all of our competition that were starting to spring up were getting, were just hitting the wall. They couldn't raise capital. And then we closed a $36.5 million round or $36.4 million round in um, October of that year which if you go back and look, there was a lot of venture money outside of that close. And so what that did is help us. And then, so we, we hired, or we, uh, uh, not hired, we um, raised the 36 and a half million, and then we fired 110 of our 175 employees. Um, and we focused on four markets. So we were in 16 at the time. And um, I don't know if you guys remember, but this thing called profits became important in the internet world. Uh, and so, um, 
and so we had to retrench and sort of focus on those four markets, and we got one profitable, and then we'd open up a fifth, and then we'd get that one profitable, and then we'd open up a sixth. And so it, you know, but, but we had the luxury of all of our competition hitting the wall. If you look at like the golf vertical, there's like six golf companies that do this, and none of them have any value. And we've been able to get, you know, I think it was 1.3 billion market cap yesterday or something like that. But, but uh, you know, we're only doing 95 million in revenue, something crazy like that. So it's a good, you know, people, you know, we're only doing about six or seven percent of the restaurant reservations nationally right now. Most of them are still by phone. So we think there's a lot of room to grow still. Um, but it, uh, it uh, is definitely, you know, uh, that, that's, does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. So, um, so right now what I'm working on is actually two projects. Uh, so here's my not maniacal focus. Uh, one is Chicago Regen, which is an information site around um, sustainability uh, for the, um, the city of Chicago specifically. You're actually moving to regenerative because right now there's a lot of evidence we've sort of overshot the Earth's carrying capacity to um, support the human species long term. And so how do we get back to being regenerative so we can actually add more carrying capacity back to the planet? And how do you do that in an urban setting? Um, it's a, it's a BHAG for sure. Uh, Jim Collins, big, hairy, audacious goal. So, um, and, uh, so working on that. And the idea is, is sort of modeled after, um, if you think about open source software. So sort of the acceleration of how many sort of companies and applications and, and, and technology is, has, has just gone through the roof. And a lot of that's attributed to open source. So, People not, you know, people being able to grab other people's tools and move on. So how do we take that same concept and move it into the sustainability realm? So how do we think about um, open sourcing stuff so that people can continue to add to it, like a kernel, like you might for for um, some software, and then be able to proliferate that knowledge at a much faster rate than we've traditionally been able to in the past? And the second concept is sort of putting that into practice now, thinking about how to move um, commerce out to individuals. So um, there's a collaborative consumption sort of movement going on right now. You look at things like Zipcar where you don't need to own a car anymore. You can actually rent it, you know, when you need it or have access to it. And so what we want to do is, you know, there's a good example of there's 60 million drills in the United States that are used like an average of four minutes a year. So how do you enable people to quickly, you know, at the street level or the block level be able to um, sh share tools or skills? Um, you know, I use this example a lot. My neighbor's a, an electrician. Um, and it would be very easy for him to go switch out a light or a light switch, a light bulb, but a light switch, you know, at any of our, anyone on our block. And how could we keep that commerce happening at the block level? Which if we not, you know, if we only had 15 million drills in the United States, because we, it was so easy to share them that, you know, uh, that would be a lot less sort of consumption and consumption is one of the big issues with sustainability. So I've got 15 seconds left. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for listening to me today. Thank you.